One of the great blessings to our church in these past months has been the addition of Darcy and Daniel Leach. And uh, remember the first Sunday they attended and uh, visiting later in their home and getting to know them and realizing the quality of their lives and the quality of their Christian commitments. And uh, then I met Randy, Darcy's dad, and uh, since the same, and of course, little Eli and Hannah, uh, the children. Uh, I've grown to love and appreciate them so much. I, I knew nothing in those early days about the story that she will share today that since those early days has become precious to me. And if you've not read her book, and if you've not uh, gotten to know them in a personal way, I encourage you to do that because uh, you will understand that here is a story of someone that not is not theoretically dealing with a period of struggle and suffering and pain and even death, but she has lived in the trenches and has walked through those experiences and shares so very beneficially today. Darcy, we're glad that you're here. I'm going to pray for you, and then you just share what God has laid on your heart. Lord God, I thank you for Daniel and Darcy and their lives. Uh, and I pray for Darcy this morning. I pray that you will just fill her with your spirit, that you will uh, let her know exactly what she needs to say and that she would do so. And uh, Lord, that our hearts would be open. We don't know what particular message you have to each one of us, but we know that we will all be able to to take something from this testimony that can help us next week and in the remainder of our lives, and who knows what we might be facing in the many years ahead. So just anoint Darcy, Darcy with your spirit, and uh, may our hearts and ears be open to that message that you have for us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I stand before you today honored by the opportunity of a loving church family to share with you one of the most important stories in my life. Uh, recently, I've spent three and a half years, maybe four, working on a story that I felt compelled to write, and it is the, the true story of my mother and brother having the same disease, myotonic muscular dystrophy. But it's also the story of surviving and thriving in a family with genetic disease. And most importantly, this is a story of faith. So from my mother is a story of faith that I am very happy to share with you. And from my mother, I'm trying to reach a broad audience, maybe an audience that deals with a chronic disease or a genetic disease or maybe a terminal disease, uh, but a broad audience nonetheless. And I use one verse of scripture in there, and this is that verse. It's Isaiah 55, 8, and it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And this is a verse that the first time you read it in the Bible, you think, well, that's not fair or exciting. Why do I want to be a part of that? But it's a verse that has so much meaning and so much truth and is really one of the capstones of my life story in living in a family with genetic disease. So this is a scripture in from my mother. And if you go ahead and show the next picture, this is me, uh, one of the first times I get to meet my brother. My brother, Dustin, was born with congenital myotonic muscular dystrophy. And that meant he had to have open heart surgery soon after he was born. He had a ventilator. He had a feeding tube. A lot of his normal functions didn't function. But... The word, the name Dustin means fighter. And that little guy fought. And before I met him, uh, he was born in Arkansas, but he was life flighted to a larger hospital soon after uh, Tennessee first, and then he'd end up in Wilford Hall in Texas. But the truth is, I didn't meet my brother until he was about three months old. And I remember uh, before meeting my brother, my father, Randy, talked to me about what it meant to have birth defects and what might happen with Dustin. And he told me as a child when I was three that I should expect to live longer than my brother. And from that moment, people have asked me how myotonic dystrophy in the family changed my life. And I really don't have an answer for them because the truth is it has shaped my life. And from being three on, I was raised in a family where we chose to cherish each day. 
where we treat it each day as a special gift, a gift that might be taken at any point to move on to more important things, but a gift that while we had Dustin, we would appreciate him and we would live with him. And even though God's ways aren't our ways and we wouldn't have picked for him to be born with myotonic muscular dystrophy, that we would accept the gift of life we had and do the best we can in those moments. So this next picture is going to show the joy in our lives. That's me at about age five, maybe six, and that's my brother. And the little girl in that picture loves her brother. He is the cutest little kid. He smiles at you. He hugs you. He might slobber on you occasionally. But he does it all in love and joy. And my brother never called me a name. <laughs> He was nonverbal, so he would, he would grunt and he would talk to us, but there was a powerful way in how he communicated because he shared the spirit and he shared a joy of life and he shared it through love and hugs and playing. And as a child, I was very grateful to have my brother and children with congenital myotonic muscular dystrophy, if they can get out of the hospital, if they survive past that, you'll see their body grow stronger and stronger. And my brother was not expected to get out of the hospital. My brother was not expected to live past three months. My brother wasn't expected to live past two years. But he kept going past those barriers. And I would pray all the time for him. My prayer life as a child was very faithful. And when I prayed, I thought I was seeing the answer to my prayers because Dustin would get out of the hospital. Dustin would overcome that cold. Dustin would grow stronger and stronger. And my dad was a big part of my faith life because um, mom was often in the hospital with Dustin. And even as a, a young girl, my father would have very real conversations with me, very honest conversations with me. And he indulged me in a habit of wishing wells. And he'd always carry change in his pocket. And anytime, there's a lot of wishing wells in hospitals, by the way, and malls and hotels, which is kind of when you have a kid in the hospital, those are the places you hang out. Uh, but anytime we went to a wishing well, even if I had to dig a coin out of the bottom of the wishing well, uh, I would take a coin and I'd wish the same wish as a child every time. God let my brother walk. Because if Dustin could walk, it would mean his muscles were getting stronger. It would me mean that he was beating the odds. And that's what I prayed for every time, faithfully, with no doubt. As a child, I could pray that way. So, in the book, it talks about my faith as a child and how I would say a prayer, throw a coin in the well, and then my dad would ask me what I wished for, and I'd say, I asked God to let Dustin walk one day, Daddy. It's what I always wished for. Go ahead and go to the next one. I had an innocence in my youth, and this picture is kind of our golden era. I have knobby knees, but I'm young and healthy. My mom is physically capable in that picture. And Dustin is in a grade school that takes great care of him. You can see his long legs. You can see his arms. At that point, he was able to wheel his own wheelchair around. Uh, he had surgery on his Achilles tendon, and they tried to help him walk. And you could put him in his braces, and you could stretch his legs out, and you could put him on a stander. And he could go a couple steps inside of a railed setting in the special education classroom or holding onto our couch at home. And really, we saw great progress, and we saw wonderful things. And that's a picture of the whole family being happy. My dad's in the Air Force, and they take good care of us uh, with the, the medical situation and everything like that. And we lived well, and we enjoyed the moments we had. And even if God's ways weren't our ways, and even if we wouldn't have picked to be exactly in that situation, we never would have said it. Because every day was a gift, and every day was a joy. And whatever my parents did, they managed to raise me to believe that we were given gifts and that we were going to live the life that we could to the best of our ability. And that's the golden era of happiness right there. You have a child who soon will go to Give Kids the World uh, Village in Kissimmee, Florida, with the Make-A-Wish Foundation because he has a terminal disease. And you have a mother in that picture who passed on that terminal disease. But you have joy in the life and the presence that God has given us. Now, this next picture 
Dustin's getting a little older in this picture, and we're at White Sands, which is near Alamogordo, New Mexico, my mother's hometown. And we have a lot of pictures of White Sands because this is a family tradition. Anytime we go down to Alamogordo, we make a trip to the White Sands. And in this picture, you see a little bit of Dustin's simple joys. He's buried in the sand, thanks to my father. <laughs> uh, but he's also throwing the sand and things like a balloon spinning or the light catching the right refraction or something going up and gravity working on him. Those simple joys gave him such pleasure. And here he's, he's hitting puberty. So if you can see the picture, he's got a little bit of a unibrow. His body's getting bigger. And when I talked about congenital myotonic dystrophy in children, they grow stronger and stronger if they get out of the hospital. Puberty is the trial by fire for children with congenital myotonic muscular dystrophy. And this is my brother's last vacation. This is his body before the genetic disease would take its hold. In high school, I was 16, and my brother had a cold. And I was downstairs, and I went upstairs to check on my brother. My dad was at work. My mom uh, was experiencing a little more muscle weakness, a little more fatigue as she aged. And part of my daily routine at this age was to help get my brother out of the bed, help get him dressed, help get him ready for school. And uh, this morning I got some time off because Dustin had a cold and he wasn't going to go to school. So instead of all those daily chores of being a, a young caretaker, I was down on my computer on the social media of the era, MSN Messenger. <laughs> and I remember after I spent my time kind of twiddling my thumbs, I came upstairs and my brother was napping in the corner of the room. And he, he was really flexible because his muscles were really loose, so his favorite way to nap was kind of an advanced yoga pose. But he'd have his knees on the ground in front of him and his back completely down, and he'd like turn his head to the side and just sleep on the ground with his head between his legs. Pretty flexible kid. Uh, but I, I stood at the door with my backpack on ready to go to school, and I stared at my brother's back. And I waited at the door until I saw his chest rise, and the breath release. And then I left and went to school. And second hour that morning, I got a phone call that got me out of the test of one of the toughest teachers I'll ever have in a hard chemistry class. And she let me leave in the middle of a test to go to the office. And I walk out that door, and I think to myself, Darcy, your brother is dead. Because I'd been raised to expect that. Because since I was three, I'd been told, your brother, there's something different about him. We have to value each day. He might leave us early. And that day had come. And I tried to tell myself, no, no, it didn't come. He's lived through many colds. God has carried us through so much. You've been praying faithfully. And I took a drink at the water fountain, and I steeled myself for that trip to the office, and I thought, well, maybe I got in trouble for something. <laughs> or maybe there's an award or something like that. And I, I walked down to the office, and I opened the door, and there my parents were, my dad arm around my mom, and my mom with downcast, sad eyes. And my dad says, Darcy, your mother has something to tell you. And I said, I know. And I did. And for a moment there, I was calm. I was at peace. I'd been raised to expect that day. And I just kind of stood there and looked at my parents and smiled, you know, like, hmm. And it didn't hit me then. And then my principal let us go into a room where we were alone and pulled out a chair for me, and I sat down. And as soon as my bottom hit that seat, the calm faded. I'd been preparing all my life for my brother to pass away. But I didn't know what to do with myself after that. This next slide is a quote from the book from my mother. And I told you how I prayed as a child, that I prayed for my brother's healing, that I prayed for miracles, that I threw quarters into wishing wells in prayers that were wishes. And I was 16 when I lost my brother. And it's a little hard to be 16 because you got so much going on. You have the hormones. You have high school around you. And this is where I found myself when I was 16. Every day I had tried to care for my brother. I, my prayers were about my brother healing, about being thankful for my brother being in my life. I had defined myself by having a brother with a genetic disease that I loved and cared for and a life we cherished that way. 
But this is the way one of the chapters ends in From My Mother. He was gone, and I was left. The race against the clock of his terminal disease was gone, and the pain was left. The hope was gone, and the anger was left. My prior way of life was gone, but I was left. And those prayers that I had as a child where I would cast a coin in a well, it didn't work anymore. I haven't thrown a coin in a well since my brother passed away, except once when Eli begged me to at a museum with a zoo. But I didn't have the same type of faith. I had prayed for years for healing for my brother, that he could walk, that we would be able to go on as a normal family. And that prayer wasn't answered in the way I expected. God's thoughts were not my thoughts, and his ways were not my ways. And I didn't know what my way was. What is a 16-year-old girl supposed to do when she doesn't have an hour of chores at home to help her brother out? What is she supposed to do when there's not a wheelchair to worry about in the mobility or the car? I was 16, and there was a freedom on me in a way because we didn't have to take care of a child with special needs every day. But what do you do after that? I didn't know my purpose. And it hurt my prayers to not know my purpose. And this is another ending of a chapter in From My Mother, but this is an honest ending. And this is where I struggled as a 16-year-old. I haven't been able to pray with the same unquestioned simplicity of hope since Dustin passed. My childhood ended the day my brother died. The naive hope that a miracle would save him, that he would one day walk, that a disease was a blessing in my family. That hope died with him. And this next one I'm going to tell you, on this next slide, it's a story I cut from the book. Go ahead and flip it. I wrote a line in the book, and I cut a lot from the book because I tried to trim it and make it as tight as possible because the truth about the modern era is people don't read as much as they used to, and a quick book is better. But I left this line in the story because it expresses the truth Alone in my room, I ask God, why are you such a cruel puppeteer? But there's more to that story. I was in my room, and I was praying, and I was trying to make sense of things, and I was trying to have God help me through it, and I was trying to have the strength to go back into a high school cafeteria where your friends talk about how they're wasting their time, how they're bored, how they hate their parents, how they're going to get stoned on the weekend, how they'd rather be doing anything than what they're doing, how they don't like themselves. And I sat there, and I asked, Why do people who are healthy devalue their life so much they only seek pleasure? And I bordered on this realm of judgment where I was angry at God for not answering my prayers, where I was more angry at God for leaving me after taking the most pure and innocent soul that I had around me. I didn't know what God meant for me. And I had lived so long thinking my brother was there for a reason, that I was born for a reason with my brother, And I didn't know what that reason was when I had to be around people who weren't chasing purpose, but were chasing pleasure. And I judged them. I judged my high school friends. I judged the people around me. And I thought, if they could only see what Dustin showed me, they would live life in a different way. And I judged myself, and I judged my God. And when I was praying to him and asking for a clarity of vision, I didn't feel an answer. And that lack of an answer led to a deep-seated anger and resentment that took me, is taking me, years to release. So this picture is of one of Dustin's favorite toys. He loved beads. It was very attractive to him. It made noise. It was tactile. It was visual. He could throw it, and it'd be okay. So he had one of these bead sets for years. And after he passed away, I kept it on my bookshelf in my room. And I prayed to God, and I didn't feel an answer. So I took that toy set, and I asked God why he was such a cruel puppeteer to give me a brother that was so wonderful and then leave me here without a clear purpose. And I threw that toy set against a concrete wall and broke it. And then I wept. And that pain didn't have a quick answer. It hurt my prayers. The next picture is of us in Salt Lake City. I'm 11 when this picture's taken. And again, it's one of those golden year pictures. Dustin's healthy and happy. 
My mother's happy. She's smiling in the sun. And in college, I tried to find myself in success. I tried to define myself by my GPA, by my athletics, by what I could accomplish. I wanted to prove to my parents that they'd done well in raising me by showing them that I was independent and could accomplish things on my own. That was my purpose for a little while. And I had a college creative writing class, and we were writing a poem about a picture. And this picture had been hanging on my wall. I stapled it to my wall in high school, and I took it with me to college. And I wrote a poem about this picture. And my college professor told me, Darcy, this is one of the best pieces of poetry that's come out of this class. You should try to publish this. And I told her, I can't. There's no way. I can't publish this. Here's one of the last lines out of this poem. I took the picture, age 11, capturing the pinnacle arc of a son to my lilac who outlived him and weeps still. Their sky has staple holes. Maybe that's how the light leaked out. And when I was 20 in college and trying to define myself by success, that was the repressed emotion. That was the hidden emotion. That's what I didn't want to tell anybody else. Maybe what Daniel heard, because we were dating from high school through college. But that's what I hid. And I didn't know how to handle it, and I didn't know how to ask God for help, because I thought, God took, took my brother, and you know what? Maybe if I got far enough along in life, maybe if I got enough success that I could figure out how to deal with that, but finding balance was hard. This next slide talks about that difficulty. It has taken and is still taking a lot of effort to find balance. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Sometimes my thoughts have been downright chaotic and fearful. College wasn't an easy time. It probably looked like an easy time. I had a friend from college that read the book because she works with me, and she said, I just thought you were Darcy in college, and you had it all together because you seemed to do so well, but you didn't. I said, no, no, I really didn't, but I tried to look like it. But in finding balance, I know I've made mistakes along the way. But I hope God forgives me for the moments where the rage is bigger than my faith, where fear outweighs the trust, and where resentment blinds me to love. Thank God for the chances we get to grow. We all need them. And my faith as a child was so set on healing and prayer, and I'll call it naive, because I believe that if I prayed strong enough that God's will would become my own, that if I were faithful enough, I would be rewarded for what I wanted, and I would get what I asked for. And reality hit in a way that I wouldn't have chosen, And it was hard to deal with. And that anger and loss and resentment set on me. But there are things that help. And one of those things that help is sitting right there and in this picture. That's my husband and I on our honeymoon. <laughs> and my husband's gone through a lot with me. But the love of a good Christian man, a relationship where you can pray together, Someone that will put up with you when you are weak, when you are wrong, and when you are hurtful. It's one of the pathways to healing. And another pathway to healing is something else my husband gave me, and that is a child. If you've ever wondered if my dad really is that rascally, the answer is yes. In this picture, my mother is smiling and holding Eli. And in this picture, my father is smiling a rascally grin and holding Eeyore. And my child, my firstborn Eli, has been such a blessing to me and really helped reframe the way I thought of life and gave me a healing that I needed. And my mother needed that healing too. She was clinically depressed after my brother passed away. She was the one at home with him. She called 911 when he stopped breathing. She tried to give him CPR as he was taking his last breaths. And it was hard on her. And she was losing her strength to a disease that does often correlate with depression, that loses 
ability to think over time because you get less and less CO2. And my plan was that my mother would watch my son with me while I worked and help me be a mother, and she would regain some of her purpose. And it seemed like a beautiful plan. Instead, this is what we got. My mother planned a wonderful 90th birthday for her grandmother, and we traveled to New Mexico, and she did all the planning, and she used lots of energy and effort. And when she came back, and when she came back, my dad came home from lunch one day, and my mom was rather unresponsive. The CO2 in her brain had built up to enough of a point where she wasn't really able to function. She had had dreams in New Mexico of suffocating. She told my dad she didn't tell anybody else. And she wanted to be strong. And my mother knew she had this disease since Dustin was diagnosed. But since Dustin passed away, she never had a doctor again that had treated her specific rare disease, myotonic muscular dystrophy. And as much as we knew about my brother, and hospitals would pay for sleep studies, and we were surrounded by doctors that looked at him as a case study and wanted to be around him, my mother had a silent disease in a small town. And we kind of forgot what the disease could do to her. So instead of watching my son while I worked, she held him with a ventilator in her throat while he was six to eight weeks old and gave him love that way. It was a sudden downturn, and it was hard for her not to be able to care for Eli, for me. And I had a sense of loss again. I'd been going to Bible studies and women's Bible studies in church, and my faith was recovering from when I was 16. But I battled with it again. And I talked to the doctor about her myotonic muscular dystrophy, and medical records hadn't caught up with us. Um, they were in the National Archives when my dad retired, actually, her original diagnosis. Uh, but I talked to the doctor, and then soon I talked to him again, and he says something like, if she has myotonic dystrophy, I don't know that there's much we can do. And there was this chance that if we could fight the pneumonia off, maybe we could get mom back. She was fine two weeks ago. But there was this chance that her muscles had just hit the tipping point and that she wouldn't be able to recover. She had an incurable disease. And what is faith in the view of an incurable disease? Well, as a child, it was wishing wells. As a teenager, it was anger and resentment. And as an adult, my heart knew she couldn't get better. I couldn't will it. It wasn't about my mental power. It wasn't about my hopes. All my prayers were, thy will be done. And part of that was because I didn't know how to talk to God longer than that. I didn't know what to ask him after I'd asked him and not received before in the way I thought I should. It's not much of a conversation to say, thy will be done, and be done with your prayer. And Pastor Roy talked about prayer changing things and the question of what prayer changes. And his answer was that oftentimes prayer changes us. And when you just pray, thy will be done, and you have a 10-second prayer, it's a little hard for God to work with that sometimes. But my mother... My mother gave me strength. In this picture, you see my mother giving me a hug from her medical therapy chair. You see her summoning all her strength to comfort me. You see her going beyond what she was expected to do at that point in order to give her daughter something that her daughter needed. In the face of an incurable disease, did my mother say, I'm angry, I'm resentful? There may have been moments. But for her daughter, she said, I am strong, I am capable. And you'll see this next picture. My mother was able to teach me things about Eli. She was able to teach me things about being a mother. And as painful as those last minutes were, those last months, I am glad for the time that I had with my mother on a ventilator. 
I took time to appreciate her. I felt honored to comb her hair, and I felt blessed to spend that time with her and wash her hair. I don't think I'd ever done that before in my life. But because of what was brought before her, because of her strength in this, because of the ability and time we had with her, I learned to value my mother like I naturally did with my brother. We've all kind of taken our mom for granted at one point in our lives, right? God gave me the time to change that. My mother trusted her Savior. And Pastor Roy talked about listen and silent are just rearranging the letters apart. And perhaps my mother was given a gift in the end when her voice was taken. When you have a ventilator in your throat, you can't talk. My mother was silent. She could lip things. She could mouth things. But in that silence, we had an iPod that we played a lot of Christian music on in her room. And I imagine she prayed quite a bit. And her mother was strong, too, and came and sang her a hymn that we sang together, All Fly Away, among many other hymns. And my mom, when there was less sedative in her, was pretty good at communicating. And one morning, I'm in there with her in the morning before doses of medicine, and my mom's talking to me in the way we can communicate at that point. And she takes her hands like this, and she does this. And she mouths, she mouths fly away. And I'm like, what, Mom? You want me to leave? Do you need me to go? And she says, go home, go home. And she meant her. And I meant, Mom, do you mean you'll fly away? And she said, yes. And I want you to look at the lyrics in this song. My mother knew what she was saying that she would fly away to a home on God's celestial shore, that hallelujah, by and by, she would fly away, that when the shadows of this life have gone, think about this in the context of a hospital with a ventilator, like a bird from prison bars have flown, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then, I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. She was on life support. She was sustained by a machine, and she was in a hospital that she couldn't leave. And she could have turned angry. But she said to us, I want to go to my Savior. I know where I will be. I trust him. I love him. I want that grace. And she did that for me, and then she did that for my family. She did that for Dad. And then when her mother and her sister came, again, she did all fly away. And she told us three different times. And we knew. We were ready. We were going through the paperwork to the ventilator, but she told each member in her family that she was going to God's celestial shores. And that is a beautiful gift to give your family. Beautiful gift. So we made the decision with her X signature on a piece of paper that we would let her go on to her Savior. And two nights before my mother passed away, Pastor Roy referenced this. But again, I was sitting with my mother in the morning when she was most alert. And she told me she had good dreams. She told me she dreamed of Dustin. And then she did this, like Dustin was running and then jumping. And I understood that. And then she told me something else. She did this number. And she smiled with a very big, glorious smile. I'm like, Mom, I don't know, understand what that means. And she had enough clarity of mind that this morning she could write. And I still have this piece of paper. She said, Dustin waters the gardens. And two days before she went to her Savior, she was blessed with a dream of her son who came to tell her that I am watering the gardens in heaven, that it is okay, we will be reunited. Come with your faith and join me. And she went with that. God says his grace is made perfect in weakness. And in that, the faith I saw from my mother let me go on to survive and thrive in a family ravaged by genetic disease. My life wasn't over when my brother passed away. I was left for a reason. And my life wasn't over when my mother passed away. My mother had a beautiful dream of her son, and she went happily to her Savior. And the Bible does tell us that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
and being born into a family with genetic disease, being born healthy into that family, I've wondered, what is my purpose? Why was I born with the gifts I was given? Well, the strongest woman I will ever know died of weakening muscles. And perhaps God's thoughts aren't our thoughts about strength. Perhaps God's ways aren't our ways about what grace really means. And God was in our story. God was in my mother. And my mother went to him peacefully. And my mother enabled our family to survive and thrive. This is a family picture taken just a few months ago. Hannah Grace, Hannah means full of grace, is in a name in the Bible, and her middle name's Grace, because that grace has been a capstone of our life since then, because my mother's strength, instead of letting me be angry and resentful for a second time, my mother's strength said grace is in this. So my daughter has two names that mean grace. But this, this is the outcome of my mother's strength. We are a happy family. My father lives with us. My mother's picture's on the wall. And we go on with those lessons to try to raise our children. And I do say our children because my father is actively involved in that with the lessons from my mother. God strengthens us in our time of trial. Mom couldn't talk. She was silent. She listened and she prayed. And here's what God promises us in Corinthians. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. She wasn't strengthened in muscles. She wasn't able to push out enough CO2 to breathe on her own. But she was strengthened in spirit. And that spirit strength passed on to a new generation. And with the lessons from my mother, hopefully I can give that faith and strength to my children one day. God's love tells us that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when we look at this verse in Romans 8, 38 through 39, we know that death doesn't separate us from the love of God. Neither do the angels or the rulers or things to come or things in the present. If we suffer adversity now, if we look at adversity in the future, a genetic disease in the family could have meant that another generation would have it. If things to come might harm us, even that will not separate us from the love we have in Christ Jesus. And my mother lived that in her last days. She was weakened. She was struck down. But she was not destroyed. And when we are afflicted, we are crushed. But we are still able to be there. Second Corinthians says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And my mother lived that in her last days. Her muscle strength was taken, but her faith grew in its place. And the Bible gives us those steps. It gives us those verses of strength. It gives us the chance to keep the faith. And even if God's ways aren't my ways and my thoughts are different than his, and I would have chosen differently if I could say, can I have a healthy brother and a healthy mom, please? Every good and perfect gift is from the Father. And my brother was meant to be there, and he was beautiful the way he was. And a life doesn't have to be long to be impactful and meaningful. And those were gifts that I am so glad to be given. Each day with my brother was a good and perfect gift. And eventually I came to realize that each day with my mother was a good and perfect gift. God did not forsake me. And even though I still have to deal with that anger and resentment that creeps up on me sometimes, God has been with me the whole time. His presence has been with me. His scriptures have been with me. And my mother's faith carried me through to be able to read these scriptures and think God's strength is made perfect in weakness. That it's okay for our bodies not to follow the typical pattern. And it's okay, and maybe even the way it's meant to be at times, or a blessing that can help us through things if we encounter troubles. And I wonder still what I am meant for but I'm finding more of it. This is a picture of yesterday. We went to a muscular dystrophy association muscle walk, and we met families like ours. And here, this is the director, the program director for the MDA. I might envy her job a little bit, uh, <laughs> but I'm holding the top fundraising participant goal, so thank you for helping me out. Some of you did a great job in getting there. But I want to tell you more about this story, because this next picture, this is a woman named Kelly. And before yesterday, I had not met her. And she had never been to a muscle walk either. And she came to me 
and she told me she wanted my book. And she said, I don't have check and cash, so how can I pay you? And we ended up, she said, I want it now, I want it today. So she PayPal'd me. And she said to me, my mom's brother died of this disease. And we talk for a little while, and I ask, so is your mother affected? And she cries a little bit, purses her lips, and nods her head. And I ask her, what type is in your family? And she tells me, I don't know. My mother doesn't talk about it. And it's hard. It can feel alone. It can feel isolating. You can feel resentment. And you, you don't want to let people know that your body's weakening for you. It can feel alone. But from my mother is a story that is a faith story, that is uplifting, that is inspiring in the end, and it gives the story of a rare disease in a human way that emphasizes what happens in the family. And this is a daughter from a mother like mine. And I have never hugged a daughter from a mother like mine before. But that moment, that moment was meaningful to me. And I've asked before, why was I born with the gifts I was? Why am I born capable, able to play basketball as my brother sat in the sands in a wheelchair? Why was I born able to write when my brother can't talk? And yesterday reaffirmed that a little bit. I was born to be the storyteller. I was born to find people like me in ways and share a story of true strength that my mother gave to me. About a month ago, I got an email from the program director from the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. And it was a personal invitation to come with my book and my story to their annual conference in Washington, D.C. And that's in September. I'm going to have to take a couple personal days, and I'm going to have to fly out there, and I probably won't make money selling my book when we count in the plane ticket and all that. But if I could give you one sentence about my mission in my life, it would be this. That my mission is to minister to those in families affected by genetic or terminal diseases with the story of faith my mother lived out in her final days. And I am going to do my best to try to pursue that goal because I have found an answer to the question, why was I born this way? Why has my life occurred this way? And I feel the calling, and I want to give my best to it. And it's such an honor to be here before you and be able to share this. But I want to tell you, too, that I feel the Spirit working, and I want to follow that. And I called the pastor who did my youth group, and I told him about that. And he's like, well, Darcy, you can't really plan for that. You just figure out where the Lord's going with you, and you go. So we want to pray for me in the near future. I am looking for ways to live out the faith story that my mother gave me. Go to the next slide. And here's why that faith story is worth so much. Because there's not everybody that's going to face a terminal disease But one of the most important things I learned with my mother was there were times where I had no grounds to judge her. That there were things I couldn't see. That there were things I didn't know. That there were grace and a spirit inside a weakening body that sometimes it was easy to say, Mom, why can't you keep working at Walmart? I need new basketball shoes. i got to fit in in high school. i got to be able to have some nice Nikes. Or, Mom, why can't you just get over Dustin's death? you got to go on with life. It's over. It happened. Come on. you still got me to take care of. And you know what? My mother did a beautiful job in taking care of me, but I didn't always do a beautiful job in being understanding and caring. And when my brother passed away and I took to judgment of wondering why people would waste their lives chasing pleasure, I wasn't loving them. I was judging them. And perhaps one of the most important lessons for me, writing was my therapist for three years. (laughs) One of the most important messages for me is actually out of the book of James and in one of the last chapters of the book. But James 2, 12, 13 tells us to speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of freedom for judgment without mercy will be shown to the one who hasn't shown mercy. This is my favorite line in the Bible. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And when we think that mercy triumphs over judgment, We can judge that something is bad. We can judge that a genetic disease isn't fun, that a terminal disease is a curse. We can get mad. We can get angry. We can judge the gifts that God has given us. But mercy triumphs over judgment. And even when we judge, mercy will find us. Even when we're angry and resentful or questioning or seeking purpose, mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's the story I wanted to capture in From My Mother. 
And that's the story I want to use in my life to share with others. That whatever may come our way, whether we're crushed or perplexed, we are not abandoned. And the strongest thing to save us, the strongest thing with us, is that mercy, that grace that comes from our Lord and Savior. Because whatever else has happened or will happen in our life, if we are in Christ Jesus, mercy triumphs over justice.